Right, good afternoon, ladies and gents, and welcome to Non-Farm Payrolls Friday uh, on April the 7th with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague, Colin Szyzynski, in sunny Toronto, Canada. Hopefully it's uh, as warm there as it is here. We're about 20 degrees here and sunny, mate, but I would imagine you're probably freezing. It is about zero degrees and it's a rain mix today and the last four, 24 hours have been just dark and dreary and it's a Vancouver kind of day. <laughs> I wish I could say I feel sorry for you but I don't. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's, let's get the risk warnings out of the way. So just, just, just got to do all of them, making sure that uh, um, everyone's um, worked their way through, through, through all of them so that... Um, our compliance team are all happy and happy clappy and what have you and then we can then we can get started so Colin non-farm payrolls what's it going to tell us about the US economy that we don't already know I would suggest not much I agree, particularly in the wake of the ADP payroll numbers that came out on Wednesday. I think the biggest thing that what the payroll number is going to tell us is that more or less U.S. job growth is continuing, that the uh, the positive momentum we've seen in the U.S. job market this year is continuing. Because what's happened was this time around it's more about expectations. When we look to ADP, the street was expecting the uh, the payrolls to drop from 298,000 last month to 190 this month, and instead we got 200. I went with 250, and uh, and I and was was pretty cl pretty close. The um I'm going again with uh, 250 for uh, non-farm payrolls uh, as well. This time around, the streets had a bit of an opportunity to. Uh, react to this, but not really. I mean, like we've got last month was 235 for non-farm payrolls. The street's expecting it to fall to 180. I don't agree. The, uh, so, and I don't agree. I think it's going to go up. I think it's going to be strong. I think the only thing that could hold payrolls back a little bit is the hiring freeze in government. Mm. But uh, but in terms of the private sector, uh, I'm thinking that things are looking pretty good here. Well, when you look at the actual ADP figures and the breakdown on Wednesday, manufacturing was a very strong gainer. And even though we saw a, uh, a decline in the services ISM component, I think the manufacturing will offset that. And let's look at the correlation between ADP, which is the yellow column here. That was 263. If we look at non-farms and the correlation between the two over the past few months, there's never been much more than, say, a 45 or 50,000 difference between the two. Obviously, there has been the odd occasion. But in recent months, the correlation has been quite good. So I would suggest given the fact that the participation rate has also been rising over the course of the past four months, that we could get 230. So I'm coming in slightly below you, but ultimately I, I, think, I still think we'll get a number in excess of 200,000. And what I'm looking for here, this is about slack in the labour market. There's been an awful lot of chat about slack in the labour market or the lack thereof. I think the fact that we're posting consistently above 200,000 means that there is a significant amount of slack in the labour market because wages aren't doing anything. And if, if, there was, if the labour market was tight, wages would be going up and that's not happening. So we're seeing an increase in the participation rate. We've seen an increase in the participation rate every month since November from 62.6 .6 in November to 63 now. So I think for me what we need to see is an increase in wage growth. And that's we're expecting 2.8 and 0.2 for that. So I think which is steady, which is which is steady. Now, if we get more than 2.8, then that could be dollar positive. But ultimately, I don't expect these numbers, and I'm pr pretty much sure you think the same thing, to drive the dollar out of its recent ranges. Certainly, in the context of where the good support on euro dollar is, we can see that on this chart here. I think if we get a decent number, we'll find support around about 105.80. Um, I can't really see us much below that. That's the trend line support from the lows that we saw at the beginning of the year. Um, but we've also got resistance uh, on the 200-day moving average roundabout here. So I think we can expect pretty much more of the same. I think the big question is, what, is ha what happens to dollar yen? And I don't know whether you want to chip in here, Colin, but there's massive, yeah, massive support at 110. Yeah, I'd just like to mention a couple more things about the non-farm payroll yeah. number before we move on to the yen. And that is uh, one thing. I think we're seeing the increased correlation between ADP and non-farm because this, the private sector is starting to kick in. The private sector is taking the lead on employment now rather than the government sector. And I think that's why we're starting to see this correlation really tighten up. Second thing, manufacturing payrolls. The street's expecting 17,000 down from 28. But as you noted, it was stronger in the ADP number. Room for a positive surprise there. That's particularly important today with uh, 
Trump and Xi having a, uh, a summit today talking trade, talking manufacturing, talking U.S. jobs being shipped overseas. If that manufacturing number is really important, because Trump's probably going to focus on that, and that could set his mood before uh, going into today's meetings. Uh, going on to dollar yen, we're, uh, we're definitely seeing the yen in a really nice established downtrend here, uh, trading between 110 and about 111.25. Uh, to me, it looks like we just, we've had a downswing. We're consolidating at a lower level, but basically we're seeing uh, yen strengthening and overall, and we're seeing, certainly we're seeing gold has, uh, has totally taken off overnight with the uh, increasing political risk. Yeah, and I think the yen strength obviously feeds into the slightly risk-off um, that yeah. we're seeing at the moment. So if I actually draw a line through these peaks here, we've got a nice little resistance coming in on the Ichimoku cloud, round about 111.20, 111.50. So at the moment, I think while 110 holds, then I think we can get a rebound back to 111.50. If 110 gives way, and I fully expect that to happen, just not today, I fully expect 110 to give way because ultimately I think there's too much priced in with respect to positives in terms of the Trump trade. I think it's unlikely now that the Fed is starting to talk about the potential for running down its balance sheet. I think it's unlikely they're going to do both. They're not going to raise rates and cut down on the balance sheet. They'll do one or the other. So they may call a pause on rate rises and actually look at getting the the rate the, the, the balance sheet tapering underway before or in place before Yellen calls time on her tenure as president of the Fed, which comes up in January. So she's only I agree. got. So that on that, so that means we're likely to get a rate hike in June. Mm, I think September. we will as well. Yeah, and I think and that'll be it. I guess we'll, and that'll probably be it. Your rate, especially because September is when you may have the real budget showdown and the potential for a government shutdown. So I've already was thinking the Fed will probably pass on September. I think you're right. At, at, at a certain point, the Fed's going to hold on raising interest rates and shift to cutting back their balance sheet. I agree. Um, so yeah, I think they've got one to two more hikes, and I, and I think you're thinking one. So yes, we're, we're yeah, pretty much, we're pretty uh, much on consistent on that. On that. Yeah, we are. Now yeah. let's look at the key support on the yield chart for 10-year yields. We're at a key, key level here. Um, a good number, I think, we'll see a rebound, or a, a, a number in line, I think, is probably going to keep that that yield chart intact. But certainly I think there is some evidence that maybe U.S. yields may be about to come lower, and if they do, this is a potential double top. Um, so double top formations generally when they wind down they tend to go the distance between the height and the base so if we project down from 2.6 to 2.3 you're talking at 2% which pretty much brings us back to where we were a year ago um, uh, in the middle or the, towards, the, towards the end of April now what could cause us that what could cause that to happen again I think it's the fact that we might start to price out three or four rate hikes and start to price in just two but again I'll be surprised if it happens today, but it could happen if people start to buy into U.S. Treasuries on safe haven buying, which obviously is also helping to boost gold. So the key level on gold, we've got six minutes to go, we're counting down. We've broken above that 200-day moving average that I was talking about earlier this week in my weekly webinar. Um, it had been capping it for quite some time. We are starting to break out, but beware. We are approaching trendline resistance from the peaks that we saw in July last year. So I think ahead of the weekend, we could see a little bit more gold strength, but I think we could bump into a little bit of selling around 1270. And I've drawn it through those, that peak there for the simple reason is that was the Trump win peak, um, which saw gold spike and risk assets briefly sell off before actually coming back quite strongly. So I'm not reading too much into that spike there, simply because... Also, I think if you go back to it, it was an intraday rather than a close, so it wouldn't be... Uh, well, this is, this, is a daily, signal this, anyway. this is a daily chart, so I mean, it's closed well down here. Yeah, so you, so that you can was a see huge that. shooting star. Yeah. Um, but so for me, I think we, we just got a few position clear outs there before we went back down again. But now we're in a steady uptrend. The likelihood is we're going to test the top of that line and drift back. So I think for me, even if we get a decent number, I think dollar downside is likely to be limited. Um, and even if we get a bad number, dollar, do, dollar, sorry, if we get a good number, dollar upside will be limited. 
and if we get a bad number dollar downside we'll be limited ahead of the weekend simply because there's too much geopolitical um, shenanigans going on for anyone I think to really have any confidence in holding a position over the weekend let's talk about let's talk about the um, Tomahawk cruise missile strikes and the effect that they've had on crude oil because mm -hmm. we've certainly seen a significant rebound there um, but it's quite significant look we haven't been able to hold on to the gains and for me this changes nothing with respect to the overall supply and demand picture for, for, for crude oil we're still in the range we're still below the February highs and ultimately I think this for me for Trump I think was his way of sending a message to North Korea and China I'm not President Obama I do have red lines and if you push me too far I'll um I, I will act upon my rhetoric and I think that's a message that you know is, is quite likely to be heard whether or not it'll make any difference is another matter but I think certainly in the context of messaging I think he's already set himself apart from Obama he's not pro he's not afraid to have red lines and then he's not afraid to act upon them now what that means for risk appetite is anyone's guess but what I will say is that the gains that we've seen in crude oil are starting to dissipate and um, equity markets are starting to bounce back and actually if you look at what the Dow's looking to do it's likely to open sl pretty much where it closed last night so as is the S&P and let's look at some of the key levels on the S&P because I think they're important as well three minutes to go look at the resistance level that I've drawn in through here we held this resistance level earlier this week we still find that there's decent support around about 2340 I think for me that's the key level 2340 um, so if we do get any dips that I think they're likely to be well bought into I'm not convinced that we're going to see a significant market reaction and if anything it's the wages data I'm going to be keeping an eye on um, Can I just mention one yeah. thing with a couple of minutes to go, Michael? Sure, go. Um, I just wanted to mention the Canada jobs are also out today at 8.30. The street is looking for a retrenchment back to 5,000 from 15,000 last month. The street has finally come up a little bit and, and, and gotten back into the positives for uh, for Canada jobs after uh, being overly pessimistic for the last three months. The, now, what was interesting was the full-time, part-time split last month was 105,000 increase in full-time and a 90,000 decrease in part-time. So there was a huge shift in Canada from part-time to full-time employment. That was a positive. What we're looking for today really is that split again. Are we continuing to see this shift of part-time jobs becoming full-time or are we going to see a retrenchment? That's, that's quite significant and the, really the big underlying thing we'll be watching for with the Canada jobs today. Dollar CAD has just been kind of going nowhere lately. Interestingly, it's not, it hasn't been confirming the rally in the crude oil price. The big rally we've, gains we've seen in crude this week, uh, things like CAD and and Norwegian Krona really haven't been confirming. So that adds to your feeling, Michael, that, that perhaps this rally is kind of getting close to done and, and crude and that it could level off, especially when you're seeing the, the shooting star and you're seeing overbought on stochastics and, and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do a quick recap. i um, just going to look at the DAX very quickly because I know some of you like to look at the DAX. And again, we're right on a very key support level on the DAX as well. I get the impression here that the we're sort of building some form of topping formations in a lot of these markets in the FTSE 100 in the DAX for me I think the key question is what's been the, what's the catalyst going to be to drive us higher at the moment I can't see one maybe a diminution of political risk I don't know but ultimately I don't think Trump is going to be able to deliver everything that he's promised and for me markets are pricing that and as a result I think if the markets are pricing that then ultimately it's going to be very difficult for them to move high you would expect them to move higher if he over delivers and at the moment I don't think that's likely so yeah, just something's, a, going, to crack something's going to crack sooner or later so let's look at let's look at the key levels I'm going to look at dollar yen for the dollar reaction because I think that's generally a good barometer I'm going to be keeping an eye on the participation rate to see if that increases from 63 I'm going to be looking at wages and obviously looking at the wake up and also don't forget about revisions to the February number for non-farm payroll so we've got 10 seconds to go dollar positive dollar yen up dollar negative dollar yen down going to be keeping an eye on the wages numbers and let's go here we go now wow that's, oh, that's a really low number. that's a low that's number that's a shocker that is an yeah. absolute shocker and the participation rate is exactly the same 63 that is an awful number 
I am yes, really, really surprised. Ninety-eight thousand. Unbelievably that low. That is shocking. What's um? Oh, look at um. Let's see. Let's. Uh, no, but, look at, though, but look at. But look at. But look at the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has dropped to four and a half percent. That's bizarre. That is really bizarre. So does that suggest that mean we're going to get a tight labour market? Because certainly wage growth is 2.7%. So the unemployment rate's dropped. It's a poor payrolls number. I don't think the dollar's going to drop off a cliff as a result of that because of the drop in the unemployment rate. I think the markets are going to focus on the unemployment rate. Let's see how the dollar reacts around 110. But certainly I think in the context, if it's able to hold above 110, the knee-jerk reaction is to sell it on the headline number. Wages are pretty much as you would expect, but the drop on the unemployment rate would appear to suggest that the market is starting to get a little bit tight because the participation rate hasn't moved. So potentially you could argue that that makes a Fed rate rise more likely and not less. Because yeah, you've got to wonder if that means that you're, you're actually starting to get close to full employment. Exactly, because it's such a low Which number, it's actually quite good, you know, in a perverse sort of way. Because I'll yeah. <laughs> does that does that make sense? I'm, I'm I mean I'm I'm sort of it does to me and it, I'm spitballing a little bit. See, looking things through the mirror, of, uh, standing upside down and through a mirror. But yeah, it does actually make sense because you think that at some point, if you are bumping into a, a theoretical full employment level, at some point you can't keep adding. You, you're going to run out. You're going to you're going to run out of people. Limit. You're going to run out of people yeah. basically. And then what's going to happen is that wages are going to start to edge up as you try. And um, you know, you, you you try you try and fill those positions. Manufacturing payrolls was disappointing. Again, I'm I'm surprised at that, given the strong ADP number. But you know, it certainly looks as if the knee-jerk reaction was to sell it. Um, and I think now markets are looking at the unemployment rate and thinking potentially, well, actually, this could well be um, a little bit dollar positive. I'm looking at U.S. Treasury yields. They've dipped slightly. Let's quickly look at that. It's dipped down to around about 2.28, 2.2694 was the low on that, but it does appear to be coming back a little bit. So I think the markets are sort of coming to the same sort of conclusion. The markets, I think, going to try and push the dollar lower. I think the big question is, will they be able to? And I'm not sure that on that number, once you once you dig around, the it ju it justifies a significant amount of dollar weakness because it's this this number here that I think people will look at and think, well, actually, maybe we're starting to get close to full employment. But we'll see. We'll see. Let's see what gold prices are doing, shall we? Let's get rid of that. So gold prices have shot up, which you would expect on a weak number. But again, I'm not convinced we'll see it break this trend line here coming in from the highs. Um, you know, it's a it's a bad headline number, but again, you know, I, I hate to bang on about this, but there is another way you could spin that number, and that that for me, I think, is 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 the key thing. So, what are equity markets doing? What's the S and P doing? Not much. Let's have a look and see what the ten minute chart's showing us. Yeah, again, markets are reacting negatively to it. Um, I don't think it's as bad as people think, but we'll see. But overall, what what is this? I think what, it's not really going to change the overall picture for me with respect to what equity markets are doing. It may change the dynamics with the dollar. Euro dollar is probably going to have another go at um, around the 107 level on the back of this number, perhaps. But ultimately, it's still in a range. And I really don't see this number is going to drive it out of that range. So we'll get a retest of 107, perhaps. Um, before we, we drift back down again over the course of the next few trading sessions. Let's have a look at what the dollar's doing overall on the back of that. And not surprisingly, it's um, it's uh, only up against the pound and the Australian dollar. It's down against everybody else. Yen's up, C Canada's up, Norwegian's up. That, yeah, um, can I mention something on Canada? You can, yeah, because it's a good number. 
Canada jobs were a really good number. They came in at 19.4 thousand, so 600 jobs off from my uh, expectation. But what's importantly, when I talked about the full-time, part-time split, this time around they're both up. We've got a full-time jobs increase of 18,400 and a 1,000 increase in part-time employment. Uh, when we look at this split, we really look at the, the full-time jobs. Uh, uh, growth in full-time jobs is a good thing. It's good for the economy, and, and so that's a, a very positive uh, a sign for Canada and we're seeing that play out with the loony uh, rallying today. Uh, sometimes we also hear in, in Canada the media reports the CAD US dollar and, and so sometimes round numbers on that can be important too. Right now it's sitting just below 75 cents on CAD US and it's sitting uh, dollar CAD is at uh, 133.60. So um, still kind of in its trading range but, uh, but definitely picking up nicely on this news. Yeah, so let's have a look at the uh, dollar Canada chart to see where the next where the next key levels are. And uh, yeah, I mean, nice little nice little push lower on the US dollar, nice little rise higher on the Canadian dollar. So yeah, as as you would expect, fairly decent report. But again, I don't think we're probably going to see much in the way of downside or upside for the Canada on on, on the back of that ahead of the weekend. Um, Unemployment rate at a 10-year low, so you know, make of that what you will. But ultimately, um, a fairly unexciting report. Yes, the headline numbers were certainly noteworthy, but I certainly don't expect that number to drive us out of the ranges that we've been over the course of the past few days. And certainly, I do think that the, 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 the put my teeth in. I do think the dollar's going to weaken. I just don't think it's going to be today. Let's look at the dollar index. Yeah, dollar index is only down a little bit. Overall, I mean, it went from 150 to 170 overnight, and now it's back to 150. So really, the knock-on effect on the dollar is fairly limited overall. And I think we saw that with you know, cables kind of holding steady, having sold off earlier in the morning, and, yeah. uh, and the euro just kind of drifting. So this, is, just kind of this is my dollar index chart. This is what I don't expect the dollar to go too much higher. I certainly don't expect it to break out of that trend line and I am still of the opinion that cable risk is to the upside not the downside. One thing that I have noted um, over the course of the past few trading sessions is the way that 123.50, 123.80 area is held. I still expect that to be the case and for us to retest 125 over the course of the next week or so. Obviously if we do break below 123.80 um, it's going to it's going to, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tricky. But uh, I just think there's so much bad news priced into the pound at the moment that really I think it's going to take something substantial to drive it significantly lower. And I think that's why next week, if we look if we look ahead to next week, um, that could be significant because we've got inflation numbers out out of the UK. We've got wages data on. Uh, we've got inflation numbers out on Tuesday. It's a four-day week next week. Inflation numbers out on Tuesday. We've got unemployment and the wages data out on Wednesday and we've also got Chinese inflation data as well so um, I think if we get a strong number there that actually could be fairly supportive so um, I would suggest that the weekend starts here and ultimately I don't expect too much in the way of significant currency moves now between now and when the market markets close this afternoon obviously barring a geopolitical shock, which I don't expect to happen because I think despite the fact that we got all of this um, nonsense overnight, I really don't think it's going to have a long-term effect on what happens in Syria or um, anywhere else for that matter. I think Trump, Trump's made his point and ultimately I think you'll get a little bit of diplomatic shadow boxing going on between the various parties but I don't think Iran is going to be too unhappy about the fact that oil prices are higher on the back of it so I think their response is likely to be the usual thing that you would expect from Iran criticizing the fact that the US has attacked an ally but ultimately I don't think it's going to go any further than that. Yeah, it does look like it's going to face, and the, the summit meeting between uh, Trump and uh, and Xi today is uh, is also significant. But uh, the reports out of last night seem to be that they were, you know, kind of at least civil or cordial to each other, and it wasn't too too frosty. As I think people were really worried that they that, that they'd get off to a uh, the kind of frosty. Uh, uh, 
rapport that we saw between Trump and uh, and Merkel a uh, a couple of weeks ago, mm. and uh, and so keeping an eye on that, uh, it does look as though at least they're they're at least on the on the surface trying to get along somewhat, but uh, certainly they have some uh, pretty big issues between the U.S. and China that need to be sorted out uh, over trade, over North Korea, uh, uh, probably, you know, a lot of, you know, signaling and, and, and posturing and, and things like that. So we'll keep an eye on that through the day, but I don't think we'll see anything really specific coming out of it. It's more of a how does it set the tone for their relationship going forward. And, and as you noted, Michael, with the, the, that, uh, that last night's missile strikes certainly could be a signal trying to build, you know, parameters around stuff yeah exactly and particularly north korea because of their incessant sort of saber rattling missile strikes and what have you he, he's basically saying to them look you know you may want to test your missiles but ultimately um at some point you're going to push it too far yeah and i think that's the message he's probably going to be trying to send um before we wrap this up because i i don't think i think we've pretty much covered everything that we need to cover does anyone have any questions on anything that Colin and I haven't already covered? Any questions? <laughs> I've just been sent a message here which I can't um, which I can't repeat. So what what's wrong with my accent? <laughs> Someone's just commented on my accent. <laughs> Okay, let's look at Sterling Kiwi. We've just I've been I've just been asked about Sterling Kiwi, so let's open. Have I got that up there? Is it there? No, I don't think it is. Actually, I can't see it. So let's let's search for it. Let's search for Sterling Kiwi. There we go. It's a strange combination. Oh, that's an interesting breakout. It's above the 200-day moving average. That's really interesting. Okay, let's dr drill down into it a little bit. Now, that's mm, one seventy six eighty looks like a fairly decent support level, right through there. Sorry, one seventy seven eighty even through there. Um, potential top, perhaps, or maybe it's worth buying the dip with a stop loss below one seventy seven eighty, perhaps. Certainly looking as if it's starting to run out of steam a little bit, but there's no question that this is a decent uptrend that we've got going on here. And maybe that's the way to play it, play the trend. Because at the moment, I can't really see any evidence that we're getting a significant reversal. That looks even and better, you actually. Look there, you're starting to approach the December highs, highs as 180? well. Yeah. So that's the 180 round number. So as long as you're support, holding that support um, that Michael's drawn in, you're in a rising channel. So far, so good. Um, but you are approaching a level where you've seen uh, past resistance. Could you put up a, uh, a m an oscillator on that, Michael? Yeah, I can. Or our side yeah, or yeah, sure. On. Yeah, I'll go study. Let's take a look. Let's look at let's look at an RSI. So we we'll use a 10-day RSI. But let's also use a slow stochastic because that's what I prefer because it's sure. less it's less it's less noisy. Um, this particular slow stochastic that I use, and then we'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, a little bit of divergence on that, perhaps. A touch. Yeah, enough to call that. That's a negative divergence. That's probably mm. enough to tell you your your upper momentum is slowing as you're approaching that 180 round number in the December high. So you could you could end up leveling off in this 177, one, sorry 178 to to 180 kind of range. But as long as you're holding the the higher lows, you're still in an uptrend. But if you start breaking it, then you've got uh, then you could see a more significant pullback. Yeah, you could get a pullback. But as I say, while it's above 177.80, then it's likely to go for a little bit of a rebound. But if it does go below there, then you're probably going to be triggering a few stop losses. Okay, so let's do the UK 100. I've been asked about that. The 72.50 level on the FTSE is the big one for me. Um, you can certainly see that borne out here. Look at these long shadows on these candles. Well, that's um, the neckline of the head and shoulders top. Yeah, potentially. So you could either draw it in there. It depends where you draw the neckline, though. I mean, do you draw the neckline through there? Um, you've got a decline. I've been using 72.60. Yeah, I've got 72.50 just in case it drops below it. But certainly, I think if you draw that in there, then. I think any any rally back to rules around about seventy three and a half, seventy three, forty fifty. 
I mean, even above the highs of the last two days, there does appear to be some significant resistance there. So through here, so 73.20, 73.30 um, is probably a decent resistance level in the short to medium term. The oscillator is turning higher. This, on the other hand, on the four hour chart, long shadows suggest that momentum is starting to stall. We could get a move back to 73.10. But I would be surprised if we don't finish the day around about 72.90 there or thereabouts. There's a question here on uh, any comment on the Fed comment about equities being fairly high the other day. I actually find that, read that, and I was quite shocked, and I actually found it laughable in some ways because the Fed, a lot of the market gains of the last several years have been boosted by the fact that the Fed put plowed all this quantitative easing, asset purchasing, easy money into the system, and it all followed the, the path of least resistance into the stock market, and the, and the Fed was perfectly fine with that for years and years and years. So I find it, I, I found it actually funny that the Fed would then suddenly turn around and complain about high stock prices when they're the ones who jacked the market higher for years. So it's a, I, I, it's, it's quite interesting that they even mentioned it though, but I think it does tell us so that it, it has actually gotten their attention that mm. they're maybe starting to think that gee maybe they've overdone it or well they'll blame other other factors than themselves. But uh, but the reality is the market has had a huge run on this Trump trade, and as, as Michael alluded to earlier, it, it's hard to see how he's going to actually be able to deliver not only everything he promised, but in the time frame that the street is expecting. Somehow, uh, after the election, the, the market has completely forgotten how difficult it is to get anything done in Congress, even when you do control it, and, um, and, and things are going to be bumpier, and things are going to take longer, and that means that it's going to take longer for it to, to get through, get approved, get funded, get delivered, and get into corporate earnings, and people are thinking so if you're running if you're running uh, models based on uh, based on earnings growth then uh, you know on uh, off of Trump then uh, you're going to find that uh, that's going to get delayed and the risk is a lot higher than than people have been thinking and at some point the street's going to run out of patience and, and so far I think what you've seen in the markets is that the first phase was you had a huge amount of capital stored on the sidelines, and no matter what happened after the election, capital was going to get in and get put to work. And then it kind of took a life on its own where the bandwagon really started going, and you had all these lagging portfolio managers going, I can't be hitting the end of the year with all this cash on my books. i got to get on this bandwagon too. And then you get into uh, into February with the, um, the retirement uh, – savings deadlines and the tax deadlines for uh, for retirement plans and those all hit around the end of February it's not a coincidence that the peak of the market was March the 1st uh, because of that that's perfect seasonal timing on on that and, and even through March and April we're still in a seasonally strong uh, time of the year but what happens when you start hitting um, May and June and the traders start running out of patience and what if you know, all this talk about tax reform being uh, done by the con when Congress recesses in August and they get to August and they're not done and uh, or you know you start getting into uh, September when they when they again could have this blowout over the uh, over the debt limit and uh, and so there's enough uh, of political risk out there internally to the United States let alone uh, let alone all, uh, external events and things like relations with Syria and, and North Korea and stuff like that so uh, at some point it looks like this could break and I think the Fed is, is starting to warn a bit on that yeah and I, I think you know the Fed complaining about high stock market valuations is up there with the Bank of England complaining about um, you know high levels of consumer credit given the fact that they were the reason that that's happened because they cut rates in August. I mean, hello, you know, why do you think consumer credit's elevated? Because you slashed interest rates in August unnecessarily, in my view, and added QE. And the, economy's, the economy was in no way um, as bad as um, you thought that it was. And I, I must admit, I thought that was a mistake. So, you know, central banks, sometimes you sort of do wonder. You do wonder. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some things end up, I think, are, you know, end up being more politically driven than the central banks would like to admit. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I've just been told that someone's from North London, Petal. Well, I'm from South London. So, there you go. South London. S-A-R-F. So, anyway, oh, <laughs> on that controversial <laughs> note, <laughs> on that controversial note, unless anyone else has any more questions... Um, we'll wind this up. Um, 
I won't be doing a webinar next week. I've got next week off and uh, I will um, see you all after Easter um, when I will return on the, God, what is it, the 24th of April, I think. 24th of April. So not in next week. I've got a week off. Um, obviously, Easter Monday is the following week. And uh, so back for the Monday market webinar on the 24th of April. So I'll take this opportunity to wish you all a great Easter and um, I will talk to you all afterwards and um, I hope you all have a very successful trading two weeks. Have a great day trading everybody. Cheers guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye everyone.